Hello, good afternoon, or good evening, or good day. So we would like to introduce uh, today uh, our, let's say, cloud native journey, what we have done for our, let's say, 5G convergent charging stack by using Apache Ignite to meet, let's say, the different telco high availability requirements, low latency, and also, let's say, make a short dive inside, let's say, 5G, what are the requirements and how we have really addressed this. So my name is Werner Kraft. I am, let's say, a senior director for product management, and I have with me uh, here, let's say, Keith. Hello, I'm Keith Miller. Uh, I'm principal software architect at Optiva. So we are both, let's say, uh, let's say, leading the session, and we are happy, let's say, to share our experience and our journey, and also happy to answer any of the questions you have afterwards. So let's introduce first Optiva. Who is Optiva? Optiva is, let's say, a PSS software vendor, and we are providing, let's say, PSS as a business support system solution for the operators to, let's say, to manage, let's say, charging, billing, CRM solutions. So we are really at the heart of the operator. So any transactions, let's say, you're doing, let's say, for example, making a voice call, making a data session, everything comes to the convergent charging system and is authorizes if you're allowed to make a transaction or not. So high availability, resiliency, always on is a key requirement from our system so that we have never any impact um, to any of the uh, of the customers. We have, let's say, uh, deployed worldwide. So we are operating from Americas to Europe, uh, Asia, even Australia. So we are reaching, let's say, the complete world. And we also have, let's say, key partners like Google and Microsoft. So when we come, let's say, to our learnings, we want to go uh, through our journey. I want to give a little bit of a cloud native evolution and what was the requirements for 5G. We want to go a little bit to the architecture and uh, give you an idea what we have done, what are the key decisions, uh, what are our learnings, the research and the proof that we are really picking the right solution and then a little bit of lessons learned and recommendations what Keith will introduce you. So when we look to the customers and telco customers, uh, having a good experience, let's say, from the internet and so on, that everything always needs to be immediately available. It needs to be on the fingertip. It needs to be immediately as a result. When you are purchasing something, you immediately need to know what is happening. So therefore, the scope, what we are really doing as part of the telco operator, is convergent charging, right? And this is, let's say, the evolution, which is also coming from the 3G, 4G, and down now to 5G. And everything what, the, let's say, the end customer is doing needs to be always in the real time. It needs to be immediately. Let's say there should not be any uh, interruption. It should always be transparent because what, when any transaction goes through our system, it's always also involved in money and customers are paying for this money. So the visibility is very key. On the other side for the Delco operator, since we are doing the revenue management for them, any transaction, any service what is available to the market always needs to be, let's say, accurate. Otherwise, let's say it results immediately to complaints and let's say customer, um, the customer satisfaction is decreasing. So when we look uh, also to the new animal, which is currently in the room, which is 5G. So 5G is now, let's say, I think in the last three, four years available, different operators have invested millions of money, let's say, to provide 5G networks. And also there are the technical aspects inside that are key also from us, let's say for a PSS uh, vendor. So the first thing is the new market features coming out on 5G, right? Of course, let's say enhanced mobile broadband is more speed, let's say lower latency and so on, what you're what you're getting. And there's also, let's say, the expansion to fixed wireless access, especially to areas or in countries where we don't have any fiber connectivity and, and so on. The second important part is 5G also enables uh, the, the operators to expand the ecosystem to a B2B2X. B2B2X means, let's say, business to business to consumer or another business and so on. Why this is important? 5G brings slice management as a capability. So that means you can really dedicate a dedicated slice to dedicated quality control, to, let's say, dedicated monetization, to a dedicated application which requires those, uh, let's say, fast speed network from the operator. And this is also a, a means what we, what the telco operators want to sell to the enterprises to make real bundles together, 
bring some additional value add to the end customers, let's say either consumer or to the business customer. Additionally, private 5G is also getting directions on, on this, also public <coughs> cloud vendors like Amazon, Google and so on are investing heavily in this area. And private 5G, you can compare similar like to a competition of the Wi-Fi suppliers, where also industry solutions, let's say sensors and so on, build up the private 5G network, having low latency, high throughput and so on. And additionally, new network functions are coming into the, the picture to, let's say, to expose new functionality. The second part, a little bit from a technical perspective, is we are moving to a service-based architecture. So we are going away let's say from proprietary uh, standards from the telco and using standard APIs or everything is restful, you can let's say use standard IT equipment. They also, let's say the third elements is new deployment requirements. All the investments are going, let's say to cloud ecosystems, either private or public cloud, depending, let's say what is the operator's uh, prioritization. You need to have, let's say flexibility, ramp up of new instances, let's say scale up, scale out, scale in are key requirement. Also time to market and continuous, let's say, CICD process across borders is key because new features, new roadmap elements are need to be shipped to the customer as fast as possible. Then we have the edge deployments where we have, let's say, low latency needs and also hybrid models where customers want to have a distributed model and let's say between a private and a public cloud or even when there are group operators between their affiliates in the different countries and for example the headquarter and the last one is about optimized resources low latency is a demand massive transactions from the iot is coming to the picture you need to really do value-based processing to really keep the revenue safe for an operator looking at the key requirements you see as a summary there are the, the, the business ones, which is where we focus, let's say, on cloud native open source technology. It needs to be cloud agnostic because we have different, let's say, customers who wants to run it in a private cloud, other in a public cloud, in the different public cloud vendors, and so on. We have, let's say, supporting of the 5G new requirements. Improved DCO is always a key topic for an operator to run cheaper and faster. Cloud automation is another element uh, what is um, important to support. From the technical side, low latency we need to do because any transaction what we authorize is in direct impact to the customer. High resiliency, SaaS recovery, active, active is a key requirement because we need to have our solution always up and running. We support SLAs of five lines. So therefore, let's say availability is a key topic. And of course, we're also doing, let's say storing money on our system. Data durability, caching persistency is an element and it's very important for, for our for us and also for the operators. And then we have the high volume metrics because we need to support uh, scaling of our solution from let's say small customers to big customers. Coming to this, what are the real deployment options when we looked on, let's say, renewing our uh, data persistency layer? The first element was we needed to support single regions. We need to have, let's say, a distributed across three availability zones what can be hosted either in a private uh, infrastructure or in a public infrastructure. We have, let's say, local traffic optimizations to really meet uh, the low latency. And we need to ensure, let's say, disaster recovery and business continuity across regions. So therefore, we also need to deploy our system in, in different regions. For example, when you look at India, India has, let's say, different states. And normally they are split it up uh, to have multiple regions where let's say you handle a subset of the customers and each region is taking as a backup of the other even in case let's say there's an earthquake or something like this to cover any of the service availability. Then we have our 5G new opportunities. <clears throat> we also have customers who invested let's say in global MVNEs. MVNEs basically let's say an enabler to sell, let's say, uh, telco opportunities, let's say, to the enterprises or to any of other affiliates. We have the distributed 5G cloud to meet also low latency. So, for example, if you have, let's say, a big country and you have, let's say, different spots for 5G, you need to have, let's say, the charging and the policy control functions near, let's say, to the core network to really meet, let's say, for the new applications like online surgery and so on, where you have low latency requirements. And then you have, let's say, the private uh, 5G 
edge clouds for private networks, what we also want to support. The third element is multi-cloud support. So we made a, let's say, as a basic decision to have uh, and to run in multiple clouds from the public cloud vendors like Google, Amazon, uh, Azure, but also for our private cloud deployments like OpenShift, uh, VMware, Danzu, and so on, because it depends, let's say, what is the operator strategy, what cloud infrastructure they use, that we are completely compliant with this. The second aspect is that there are different uh, multi-country requirements and also privacy laws where you need to have data and we are dealing with customer data it needs to be, let's say, in the country and can't be, let's say, outside the country. So all of this, let's say, flexible uh, deployments, uh, we need to support, let's say, with our single uh, stack from the customer. Then the last point is TCO. TCO is always a key element of the operators and we are scaling, let's say, from a small cluster, for example, three small bots supporting, let's say, 100K customers. But we have, let's say, to scale up our solution to support 200 million plus customers, which are then, of course, let's say, from a sizing perspective, uh, uh, let's say, a budget clusters of, for example, 20 nodes or more, depending, let's say, what is the traffic model. Then we have also hybrid disaster recovery for TCO options. You have, let's say, for example, like in Afghanistan, Iraq, local info, uh, let's say local charging and policy running, but you have, let's say, your disaster recovery in the public cloud to, let's say, have a cost optimized, uh, let's say, solution. And the last item, automated deployments, let's say multiple instances is a key element, but we also looked uh, on it. Also on the automatic deployments is also the observability, what we need to have. And, and, and therefore, let's say we have done quite some important investments in this regard. So when we look uh, in our journey, when we looked at our data persistency, so we have taken four steps. The first step is when we, let's say me, Keith and our colleagues were sitting together and said, okay, what is our cloud native blueprint? What, the, what we need to do, how our data needs to split up from a traditional, let's say, two nodes uh, SQL database, uh, how we need to, let's say, adapt our microservices and rewrite dedicated elements to really fit, let's say, to a cloud native solution. Afterwards, we did some paper analysis, have defined all our KPIs, which we, what we need to measure, and also what are the key test scenarios. Let's say, for example, the scaling, scale out, scale in, uh, let's say, zero touch upgrades, let's say, rolling software upgrades and so on, so that we are not having any customer impact. Then we did our prototyping and the technical evaluation. So we have written dedicated database, let's say, client who really tested the technology to meet all our criteria. And then we moved, of course, to the production grade implementation, where we have implemented this in our services. We have, let's say, built up very detailed dashboards to comply also to an SRE approach, where we have SLIs, SLO defined to really say, okay, what are the key parameters in the database? What are, let's say, the key uh, factors, latency, let's say, availability, data replications, and so on, as these are, let's say, key elements for our care and also for the operator to supervise the solution to ensure that it's always up and running. So I would like now to hand over to, to Keith who can give you a little bit of a details on, our, on the architecture and how we have implemented the solution. Yeah, thanks Bernard. So I suppose when we look at where we came from, um, we had very much a traditional SQL database with a, you know, a big iron system with a, a storage array behind it. The only choice we had there when we needed to increase throughput was to, to scale vertically, um, which obviously only works up to a point. So one of the, the major things we needed to solve was when we moved to a, a purely cloud native approach, how do we scale horizontally? How do we split up our system in terms of what data needs to be secured on disk? What data needs to only go in memory because it's high throughput? Um, we looked at all those requirements together and actually Apache Ignite came out as a, as a very good fit for, for pretty much all of our requirements there. So we can do in memory on disk, we can scale out horizontally, um, Apache Ignite deploys in Kubernetes. Um, what we also did was took the opportunity to, to take a look at the way our services interacted with the database and split those into microservices and in, in introduced an event bus. 
Um, so it really was an inflection point for us in terms of changing our architecture when we moved away from a traditional database into to something that's distributed and, and cloud native. But I suppose it's not a simple thing to actually move from a traditional SQL database to, to a distributed database that does support SQL. But at the same time, you know, we want to optimize different things. So we kind of learned a lot of lessons along the way. Um, so in terms of the lessons that we learned, um, when we went into the project, we went in with a requirement to, to, to support both public and private cloud deployments. Um, I suppose when we naively started, we, we just assumed that, that public cloud would perform the same as private cloud and different public clouds would um, perform the same as the other public clouds. Um, I would say that's definitely not the case. You kind of need to look at what infrastructure that public cloud has under the hood. Um, and you need to very much get into a cycle of automated performance testing and observability so that you can test against all the public clouds that you're going to support and the private cloud you're going to support to understand the performance concerns that you've got there. Also, um, when we look at our, our system requirements and, and our customers' requirements, there, there's very much a, a requirement to have geographical redundancy of data in real time. Um, so Ignite kind of helped us a lot here in terms of having um, conflict resolvers. So we, when we asynchronously replicate between two sites, if there's a conflict, as in uh, the same data record has been updated from both, both sites at the same time, Ignite has a, a good conflict resolver mechanism where we can inspect those data changes and, and merge those data changes into a, a consistent record in a consistent way. Um, also, when we looked at 5G, we, we took a, uh, a kind of detailed look at all of the data models that we had and where we were putting data and how that data was used and how frequently that data was updated. So when we look at the 5G data models, we pretty much, you know, we did a lot of denormalization of our schema to optimize the DB layer in terms of this particular value needs updating, you know, 10,000 times a second versus this particular value, you know, doesn't really change that often. So those are the kind of the lessons that we learned. Um, so I suppose just to, to kind of summarize on a technical level. So when you go into a project like this, make sure you have all of your use cases and all of your requirements documented and understood um, fully. Look at the data patterns that you have. Look at the data that you're storing. Look at how that data is used, because that will enable you to understand what is a performance pain point versus what isn't. And you might decide to, to move that data into its own instance of the database uh, or in memory versus on disk. Um, another thing we learned is don't try and uh, don't try and shoehorn everything into a one size fits all. We were quite lucky with Ignite in that it's quite diverse in the use cases that it supports. So it's in memory, it does on disk. You can segment the data, you can distribute the data, you can localize the data on specific instances. Um, that ended up with very much a, a one size fits all for us because we were lucky, but don't try and force that, I would say. Um, and lastly, I suppose, get consultancy and get experts in to help understand the technology. So when we started the project, we didn't know anything about Ignite at all, really. Um, uh, the guys from Gridgain actually helped us with that quite a lot. So, but we now, you know, are at the, you know, running towards the end of the project, we now see the, that we have a lot of internal expertise there, um, you know, helped by folks that, that we consulted with. So, uh, so that's it in summary. I'll just hand back to Bernard now just to sum up. Yeah, so thanks, Chris, for, for giving, let's say, the learnings. And for me, also so from my product management perspective, it was a great journey how, let's say, the architects developers was working together to really get excited about the solution, how we can really achieve the different requirements. And, and especially, let's say, having a completely refreshed 5G, let's say, conversion charging solution uh, available for our customers, for the market, to really drive, let's say, the transformation towards, let's say, 5G helping the operators, let's say, to monetize new revenues which are coming out and having, let's say, a really state-of-the-art, let's say, solution. And we are happy, let's say, to using Apache Ignite as one of our core data persistency layers as part of it. So thank you very much for having us, let's say, today. Let us the sh uh, share the journey. And if you have any questions, please just raise it and we are happy to answer. So thank you very much for listening in. And thank you, Keith and Bernard. Let me bring you onto the stage.
Um, a little bit of background noise coming from somewhere. It can be it's raining on my side heavily outside. <laughs> yes, the weather. It's not often that the weather interrupts a virtual um, conference, but there you go. That's, that's always, you need to have a disaster recovery solution in place. <laughs> <laughs> So um, we have a, a couple of questions. We don't have a lot of time for a lot of questions. We're running over. Surprise, surprise. This never happens in, in, uh, in a summit. Um, but we do have um, a couple of questions. So um, one is about um, your production um, uh, environment. So what are the three top parameters that you supervise in production to see your performance constraints? Yeah, so I suppose, I suppose I can answer that. Um, Primarily, you know, you, you've got the, the the typical three, which is, uh, you know, your CPU, your memory consumption, and your IOPS. Um, but I suppose whilst those are the top three and that CPU and memory can, you know, determine when you want to scale out, we also do actually, you know, closely monitor the, the latency per transaction because we're very much an LTP uh, solution. So our transactions are pretty even. Um, so the latency shouldn't fluctuate very much, but also we look at the latency for the for the, for the storage-based uh, caches that we have. We look at the latency of the uh, the disk itself, so not necessarily just the IOPS. It's like what are the queues like in terms of how long does the IOP queue, um, how long does the IOP take to process, because that is back to back uh, a problem with late, you know causes a problem with latency if it degrades in any way. So I suppose the top three are, are the typical three, but we do have two more uh, that are very important to us, I suppose. Okay. Um, next question. Um, 5G and distributed deployments. Are you running multiple separate clusters? Um, and if so, what's the criteria for separating into the different clusters? Yeah, I think let me answer that one because this depends, let's say, what is the deployment architecture from operators. Right? When you look at the Americas and they want to structure the different areas where they're deploying, let's say, local 5G or 5G networks where they address um, the new requirements, expose slice capabilities, and also a uh, promise low latency, high quality of services, and also all of those parameters. Let's say the monetization platform needs to be also near. So we, we split up, let's say, the distribution of the cluster based on the deployment architecture, but also when customers are traveling there, right? In 5G, they register on the network, then we get to know, okay, this customer is registered in these re regions. We're ensuring, let's say, the data locally there, and we're ensuring from a charging platform that here we are having very low latency responses, let's say, in, in as a milliseconds ranges to really support the services. So it's this kind of, let's say, separation, which means deployment and where the customers are traveling, let's say, within the country to make it localized. Yeah? Great. Okay. Um, we've got time for one more quick question, and um, it's one that you covered slightly before, so I'm going to modify it a little bit from the uh, original asker, but um, we were talking about the different boxes that it checked. So. Let's modify this question slightly, not just what were the different databases you were looking at, but what came the closest to being an alternative to Apache Ignite? Uh, it's a good question, maybe. <laughs> I, can, I can take the, uh, I can take that. Uh, I think, so it depends where, where we decided to, whether we decided to compromise on, on requirements or not. So if we compromised our SQL requirement in certain areas, you would be looking at something like a Redis or something like that. If you never compromise your SQL requirement, you'd be looking very much at like a CockroachDB. So um, those were the, the kind of two runners that had pieces of the puzzle, but not every piece of the puzzle. But in the end, you decided no compromises. Well, we, we decided, you know, we, 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 we liked the idea that we could, you know, take a lot of our secret statements which were which were fairly simple and just pulled those over and then look at value pair statements where we need the you know where we needed the uh, hyper low latency on the data path because there's always a an expense to parsing SQL, right? Um, but yeah, we liked to have the best of both worlds there, which it meant all the management side of things, we didn't have to rewrite all the SQL to value pair. Um, but we gained the advantage of not parsing SQL statements when we when we wanted to take advantage of that. 
Excellent. Good. Well, Keith, Bernard, thank you so much for your time. Thanks for joining us. Um, there are a few talks still left, so we hope you'll stay and listen in. Um, and as I've said before, we hope to see you coming and presenting in, in future summits. Yeah. Thank you very much for having yeah, us. Thanks very much, everyone. Thank you.